Hello, everybody. Super excited to have you today. Uh, great panel discussion we're going to have uh, uh, around uh, bridging the gap between model development and machine learning management. I'm really excited today. I have a group of great panelists uh, to have discussion and some real use cases for machine learning today uh, that are happening in industry. So to get started here, I uh, want to introduce uh, our, our, our speakers uh, for the, the panel today. So uh, Carl, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Diego, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for having us here today. My name is Carl Case. I'm a partner that leads our financial crimes technology consulting team uh, here at, at EY. Uh, and as a part of that team, uh, we focus on applying technology to uh, a really common problem uh, in financial services today, which is um, money laundering, fraud, uh, trade surveillance, um, and, and using technology, which includes AI, machine learning, uh, and analytics um, to help address uh, some of those problems. Greg? Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. My name is Greg Capice. I am part of Carl's Financial Crimes Technology Team at EY, um, and I am really elbows deep in applying some of the AI, AI machine learning and analytics that Carl was discussing. Um, and I think as we go through uh, our agenda here today, we'll hopefully bring some of those examples to life. So thank you all. Great to have you folks. So my name is Diego Oppenheimer. I'm the CEO and founder of Algorithmia. Algorithmia is a machine learning operations and management platform. Uh, and so we help organizations deploy, run, and, and uh, manage their machine learning uh, models at scale um, and bring some of these use cases to life. So very excited to be chatting with everybody today. So every year, Algorithmia does a survey of over 500, 400 individuals in AI and machine learning. And we ask a bunch of questions around how they're actually applying machine learning, what is it taking to deploy models, how difficult it is, and the time that it's actually consuming uh, to do that. And one of the interesting things that came out in our most recent study uh, going into 2021 is that even though there is more organizations applying machine learning uh, to their workloads, there's more models uh, going into production, actual time uh, that it's taking to deploy those models and actually get them into production is actually increasing. And this is a really interesting trend because it means that there's, you know, one of the things that we look into is there's more use cases, there are more important use cases, um, but actually industrializing that aspect of going from idea to actually how we deploy into a customer and actually run those models uh, is actually increasing, uh, which really speaks to the need for an industrialized process uh, to be able to do that. So why, what's happening here? And so, you know, we look at these deployment challenges and why is it that, that these things are, are, are taking a little bit longer? So there's some generic things around AI and ML, uh, which are really interesting, which is first is um, it's a new space. So there's conceptual difficulties of, hey, we continually underestimate the amount of knowledge and, and need to be able to develop the effect of these solutions, understand the results they're giving and how we actually get them into production. Um, the number of data scientists and kind of generally like the number of machine learning engineers out there is still very limited. And so we are highly constrained on the resources that can be actually attached to this uh, and put in this work. So a lot of the time, the tooling that is meant to help these data scientists is extremely important because this is an extremely uh, constrained resource that uh, we're trying to use. Then we go into production challenges. And this is really the, the time it's requiring to deploy a trained model to production. It's actually increased, uh, you, know, uh, you know, with 64% of organizations taking a month and longer. And when you double click into one of these production challenges, it isn't the difficulty of wrapping a model in an API, but actually getting through all the security, IT audit, and governance controls that large organizations require. How do you actually move through that process? How do you get approvals? How do you get security sign-offs? That's really the core part that's actually stopping a lot of these organizations to truly achieving production. And then finally, um, governance requirements. 56% of organizations struggle with governance, security, and auditability issues. And actually 70%, 67% of uh, organizations now actually need to comply with one or more multiple ML regulations. And uh, this is obviously something that uh, the UI team here knows uh, very well, the world of regulations. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, so I'm gonna uh, pass this on and, you know, maybe Carl, you can tell us a little bit about 
what are some of the challenges specifically in financial crimes that uh, you know that, that that bring ML to light? Yeah, sure thing, Diego. And and I think uh, you know some of the points you raised were were really interesting, particularly around uh, how deployment times are rising. I, I think we see the same thing um, in addressing some of these challenges in financial crimes. Uh, you know, really in tackling some of the manual processes, we see a wide variety of data science teams and our clients uh, looking to bring uh, new analytics, new models in uh, innovative and in interesting ways. At the same time, you know, that introduces a lot of variability uh, in the equation. So different libraries being used, very complex uh, and, and highly variable technology environments, right? That uh, ultimately when you're trying to move to production, reduce standardization, um, uh, in, increase the level of complexity and, and really extend the amount of time that it takes to get anything, as you said, you know, reviewed, approved, and then ultimately deployed and, and bring benefit to the organization. Um, as we look at financial crime more specifically, I think a lot of, a lot of folks look at, um, pattern detection and the, the ability to use some of uh, the existing technology systems to highlight potential uh, areas of interest to investigators and analysts. Um, but, but really we see with some of the legacy systems that aren't using um, advanced machine learning or, or AI techniques, there's really a lack of risk prioritization. So you get a whole blob of, of stuff, you know, potentially thousands of uh, alerts or um, articles that that are potentially that may or may not apply to uh, your customer population, and and there's a lack of prioritization from the system that says where you should really be looking, and it says, hey, go look through the entire haystack to try and find that needle. Um, the, the last piece there, and, and I mentioned this earlier, is just around the the disparate systems, um, not, and not only that are in the existing legacy environment, but then the, the fragmented landscape of uh, open source and bringing that uh, together, you know, open source being very common for a lot of the, the data science teams, um, you know, coming from academic backgrounds, bringing in new libraries, the newest techniques, um, it, it's introducing constant change to a already complex landscape. So there's really gotta be a way to to reduce that complexity, simplify, standardize, uh, to really get to a, a streamlined deployment model. Yeah, it seems like uh, you, you folks have your uh, work cut out for you in terms of all the different systems and feeds and uh, the needs and feeds uh, around uh, that, that happen into the, the financial crimes uh, area. So we're definitely gonna double click into this. I think the, the use case that the Erson Young team here um, uh, works with is probably one of the more interesting uh, use cases in ML in production today that we've seen. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll be able to double click a little bit here in, uh, in a couple minutes. So, when we talk about machine learning operations and management, we, we like to talk about these kind of, uh, you know, kind of this m moving cycle. It's a continuous cycle that, that is, that is, uh, that, that between ML development where you're building the models, you're validating them, you're uh, verifying them, you're having controls around what data can be used, what data cannot be used. And then we actually get to those candidate models. And when we deploy those, how do you manage those models in production? How do you connect to the different data services that exist? How do you register uh, you know, uh, those models. And then in particular, how do you actually pipeline them together? Models don't live in isolation. Processes don't live in isolation. So how do you actually manage the full pipeline of workloads coming in, the different predictive analytics that are coming out there? And finally, we get into the operation side of things, which is, okay, who's calling what, when, with what data, what time? How do I manage the infrastructure in it? How do I scale? You know, some of these workloads um, are extremely large. There's a lot of data being processed. How do you scale up and down uh, while taking a, a particular look in terms of what we call kind of governance and security, which is data network and model security, infosec compliance, and actually regulatory compliance. So when we look at the world of machine learning operations and management, all of these components are, are extremely important to be able to actually get into a repeatable, scalable, and secure process so that you can actually have success in your, uh, you know, kind of machine learning powered uh, use cases. So with that said, let's uh, get into the panel here. Uh, very excited about uh, chatting. I, I get to ask uh, so, so some cool questions. So Carl, I'm gonna start with you. 
Um, and I'm curious, how has Ernst & Young reduced fraud and money laundering through the use of ML? And can you share some examples of, uh, of how that's done? Yeah, sure thing, Diego. So I think um, uh, really analytics in, in the anti-financial crime space has been uh, evolving uh, for a number of years now. Um, I, I think most folks are familiar with um, sort of the, the heuristic or, or rule-based systems um, that exist today. You know, they look at your transactions, they say, well, I couldn't have been in California and New York, you know, in, in a five minute span and it generates an alert, right? Um, that, that's probably the, the most common way that we see uh, some of the machine learning being used. But really over the last three to four years, we've seen a, a tremendous uptick in the number of use cases. Uh, I mentioned earlier some of the, the manual processing that happens um, in terms of investigating uh, those alerts, understanding the nature of transactions. Um, when, when you look at financial transactions that are occurring, really what you're trying to understand is um, the nature of the relationship between two parties. Why are they transacting with one another? Are there odd patterns of behavior that are occurring? And this is where uh, machine learning can excel in anomaly detection, um, in identifying uh, patterns of recurring behavior or, or even aberrant behavior. And then when we look at some of the bulk processing of information, so um, if I'm doing research around two counterparties and I wanna understand um, there, that there's a supplier and there's a consumer um, from a business standpoint, you know, can I go out to open source information? Sometimes that can be third party data providers. You know, sometimes that's just the open internet, Googling. Uh, Google's probably your financial crimes investigator's best friend uh, in terms of gathering information, right? And uh, can I understand the nature of their business? Um, can AI help me do that? So can I scan a company's website and pick out, you know, that they are a machine parts provider? And then obviously, if they're sending that off to an industrial uh, and, and we understand that that's the counterparty, well, you, we can make that connection. We can establish that automatically without having to have thousands of people out scanning websites, copying and pasting them in order to create documentation, audit trail, right? So there's, there's uh, probably dozens of different examples like that during the financial crimes, investigations and analysis lifecycle where we really get to see um, those AI, machine learning and automation use cases applied. And so obviously the audience, the audience we care about outcomes, like what is that, how fat, you know, is it, you know, the before and the now, right? I mean, like, what's the acceleration look like? I mean, like, is this like, it just takes the same time, just done cheaper? Is it like done in half the time, a quarter of the time and cheap? Like, like what's the what, what's the results of being able to do this automation? Sure, great question. I, I think we really see that happening in, in two dimensions. One is, uh, how, how do we improve some of those legacy rule-based systems? So can we just reduce the amount of work that needs to be done or the, the amount of noise be coming out of the system, right? If I have some simple if then else type rules in the system, I'm potentially generating thousands or tens of thousands of, of false positives. Really your legacy systems we see from a performance standpoint generate in, in some cases 99.9% .9 false positives, right? So can we take uh, machine learning and AI layer that on top and reduce the overall amount of noise. And when we've seen that applied, we see clients that have had initial results reducing that noise by 30 to 40%. Um, when they've had that in production for a number of years, they get more uh, comfortable with uh, the risk tolerance, with the model risk management um, of those systems. We, we see those uh, improvements uh, rising up to the levels of 70, 80, even 90%. So very significant just in terms of the amount of output that, that uh, the institutions need to handle. The, the second dimension is then on how do we make work faster, right? So can we get the massive amount of information that an investigator needs to process and can we curate that using some of the analytics. So how do I get thousands of pages of Google results? How do I get the third party data and get that down to uh, the, the one to two pages that an investigator can quickly review and then make a determination. There's something suspicious that's happening here. I need to go and make uh, a suspicious activity filing. Yeah, no, that's pretty impressive. 
So Greg, I have one for you. So um, how have you, you know, why has it been important for, for you folks to kind of industrialize the process of kind of reducing financial crimes at scale? And then I have a second part to that question, which is how were you able to kind of reduce deployment time for these customer needs? So kind of that industrialization process and reduce the time to get to, to, to market. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Diego. So um, Carl hit on a lot of good points there. So within financial crimes, I think that um, and the financial crimes folks listening to this are probably going to roll their eyes, but we always talk about effectiveness and efficiency, right? So what Carl was emphasizing there was being able to monitor more effective. So if you're able to reduce your noise and monitoring by 30 to 40 percent um, and also improve the coverage and the, the bad actors that you're capturing, it's a no brainer, right? So the challenge though, and why industrialized platforms are so important is to be able to minimize the time to capture that benefit, right? So to me, when I think of an industrialized platform, we have systems, we have frameworks in place that allow us to rapidly deploy these technologies to really maximize benefit as soon as possible. And then on the efficiency angle as well, you know, Carl's talking about the investigators reviewing thousands of alerts, anything that we can do to deploy faster and, and really provide uplift as soon as possible is important. Um, the other, and then the second part, Diego, of your question there around, you know, how, how having, um, you know, frameworks such as Algorithmia in place allow us to deploy faster. Well, I know citizen developers and citizen data scientists are kind of all the rage. Um, I think that there's a sweet spot or a missing component around citizen DevOps Right, so being able to allow our business analysts to actually deploy their own models without having to go through, you know, a lengthy agile process just saves a significant amount of time. And I mean, anecdotally speaking, um, prior to having some of these tool these toolings in place, it could take us, you know, similar to what was on par with the industry, right? You know, multiple months to deploy models, um, but then after deploying some of these tools, we're able to deploy models in a matter of weeks. And now we're, we're measuring model deployment in a number of hours. Yeah. And I can't, yeah. uh, I can't begin to overemphasize the, the benefit of time to market here in the financial crime space, right? Probably very similar to what you see in the front office and on, on the retail side of things. This is a highly dynamic environment, right? Fraudsters, criminals, they're always changing their behavior. And I think Historically, financial institutions have struggled to keep up with that pace of change, right? The, the, the business side is introducing new products. Those products have vulnerabilities to crimes. And at the same time, the, the compliance and the financial crimes team struggle to, to keep pace and, and change, particularly when you then exacerbate that by taking three to six months to deploy a new detection model or a new automation framework into uh, production. So uh, the, the speed is really a, a critical item in terms of getting the financial institutions to uh, be able to effectively combat financial crime. Absolutely, and you know, my, 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 my kind of external observation, one of the things that I've been, uh, you know, particularly impressed with, uh, you know, what you folks have done is, you know, the early focus on repeatability uh, that really has uh, been able to make you reduce the cost per action uh, and, and, and kind of do more with less. Uh, I think that's been uh, one of the kind of like, uh, kind of the way I've, that I've seen you modularize your applications and kind of the use of microservices and deployment of different machine learning models. Like um, we've definitely been able to see kind of how, how quickly you've been able to repeat things. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a core, maybe even uh, overlooked part, which is the repeatability just lets you do uh, in a standard way, it lets you do more faster. Uh, and I think that's been a, a quite impressive. Yeah, I think uh, we, we run across quite a few organizations that overlook that component, Diego. And I, you know, that, that last slide you had up there where, you know, there's model development and then there's two more pieces afterwards. And we, um, pr particularly with institutions that are new to the AI machine learning space, I think all the focus goes to that model development bucket but at the end of the day, I like to cl tell clients that bucket's just math, right? And we can all do math, but the, the complexity comes then in the execution, the delivery in the other two phases, right? How do you standardize that? How do you actually get it pr to production? And that's where we see a, a lot of institutions getting hung up. It's not in doing math. We can all go out and get a statistician. We can all get a data scientist to go out and build a model. But then how do we productionalize that? How do we run that over millions of transactions and do 
complex layers of, of aggregations built on top of one another and manage that effectively over a long period of time. Well, sadly, we're almost out of time here, uh, although I think we could probably talk for hours. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody in the audience for joining us today. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to Carl and Greg for any of your financial crimes investigation needs uh, and to see a lot of the cool work that they're, that they're doing. And uh, please go visit our booth uh, at Algorithmia for, uh, you know, to talk a little bit more about how you can industrialize ML in your organization, deploy, serve, and models at scale. Uh, Carl, Greg, thank you so much uh, for your time today. This was great. Thanks thank so you much, all. Diego. Thanks for having us.